Welcome everybody, my name is Krush AK and this is the Market Meditations Podcast. We chat with fascinating people from around the world to extract mindsets, routines, stories and habits to help you build richer lives. Meditators, today we have Jason Choi here to teach us all about investing in the DeFi space and learning about how to spot the right early stage projects. He's a general partner at the Spartan Group Fund, founder of the Block Crunch podcast, DeFi angel investor and all round extremely intelligent guy who really knows a thing or two about investing. Before we jump into this episode, don't forget that I send handpicked market news, insights and education to over 6,000 traders and investors three times a week. To get access to this, all you have to do is sign up to karushak.substack.com. And also a quick thanks to our partners you trust for making this podcast possible. There'll be more on them later. Market Meditators, welcome to another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. Today, we have another incredible guest that I'm really excited to talk about because we haven't quite dived this deep into the investment side of crypto, specifically DeFi for a while. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me and apologies for this weird setup. I'm, uh, it's nighttime here, so I'm just back in my bedroom recording. I uh, know it's a it's an awesome s- setup. We absolutely love it here in crypto. Like we just work twenty four seven. So I've had people <laughs> like all sorts of states show up, and it's awesome. I think it's uh, a great vibe, and the audio quality is amazing, which for most of our listeners is what matters. And uh, so normally I don't start with this sort of question, but I think it really frames the conversation nicely. How did you end up, Jason, as general partner at the Spartan Group? Yeah, so it's been a long journey. Um, so to give listeners some background, Spartan Group, we started as an advisory firm back in 2017. Um, so we helped with some projects basically in the West expand over to Asia. So these are projects like Solana, you know, Dapper Labs, Blockstack, and projects like Deribit. We you know, structured the sale for that and the portfolio sale to FTX. But then in 2018, we started an investment arm. So that's actually when I joined the team, when I first uh, we returned back to Hong Kong and I met our current CIO, Kelvin, who spent 20 years at Goldman Sachs and then two years at Indus Capital before he started Spartan Capital. And we realized that we had a very complementary skill set where you know he brings a lifetime of experience from the financial industry. And then I bring my kind of crypto native uh, curiosity. Um, so we've been investing in crypto together um, since 2018, since the start of the hedge fund. And just this year, 2021, we launched our DeFi Venture Fund, which is a separate entity to invest in kind of long-term DeFi projects. And uh, Kelvin and I are both GPs on the fund, and we've been investing in uh, founders in DeFi for for about a few months now. But the announcement of the fund just came out, I think, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, amazing. And I'm looking forward to diving deeper into uh, the specifics of that fund. One thing I'd like to find out a little bit more about, if you're comfortable sharing, is that BlockFi deal, because that was huge and incredible. What was the thought process behind that? Why did you guys see that connection and make it happen? Yeah, so I wasn't as plucked into the portfolio deal, given that it was on the advisory team. But I think our team just has a penchant for working with world-class founders. So we try to find companies that we think are really industry defining, really has impact on the industry. And we try to find synergies for them. So that was very much the case for Blockfolio um, sale to FTX. We thought there was a natural fit there, Um, but that was all of my colleagues work. I wasn't involved in, in that transaction at all. Oh, still incredible to hear about and awesome that uh, your colleagues have done that. And now you are a big part of that launching the new uh, VC fund. So could you tell a little, tell us a little bit about the uh, overall investment thesis? What guides your decisions, reasons for making the fund and running it going forward? Yeah, so we've been investing in crypto since 2018 out of our liquid hedge fund, which is about $100 million right now. Um, And we invest in the wide variety of different assets in crypto. So layer ones, layer twos, DeFi, uh, Web3 native assets, you name it. And then throughout those past two years, when we were investing, we realized that a lot of the activity, a lot of the fees that were generated, actual revenue was being accrued on protocols that were actually paid in DeFi. And we realized that, okay, there's something here. This is clearly a breakout category within crypto, and we wanted to dive deeper into that. So through that main fund, we've invested in projects like Alpha Finance, uh, which has a lot of um, adoption lately and also a lot of drama around it with some recent events um, They're happy to go into later as well. 
Um, but yeah, through through those experiences in the past two years, we realized that, okay, this is a breakout category and the most impact we can make is probably as early on in the life cycle of a project as possible. So we wanted to start a venture fund to really be that first check in to founders. And we don't just invest in the founders with capital. So we also work with the founders very closely on things like token economics, go to market strategy, especially for projects that want to come to Asia and tap into that user base. That's something that we specialize in as well. So it seems like you have an incubator that comes with uh, the investing that you do. You really help build these projects from the ground up, which I imagine your experience from 2018 helps a lot with. Yeah, I wouldn't call it an incubator. It's more just um, kind of portfolio company support, especially because the venture space is incredibly competitive right now. There's so much money chasing so many different projects, so so little projects. So it's very important to differentiate ourselves beyond just capital. Um, so we have to provide much more than just capital. And to be honest, I personally really enjoy working with people a lot smarter than myself and supporting these founders, helping them kind of brainstorm different ways to break into different markets. So um, yeah, we've been doing that for a couple of projects and we're excited to bring that to more founders. Uh, it's definitely a recurring theme right now that uh, there's too much money in the space and uh, not enough strategic contribution. So uh, in, in what ways do Spartan um, Capital separate themselves? Is that the name of the VC fund as well? Is that is it all under that umbrella uh, to make sure I'm not confusing listeners? Yeah, so we have the parent group, Spartan Group, and then we have Spartan Advisory and Spartan Capital. And under Spartan Capital, we have separate funds. So we have the main hedge fund, which is what we call the Global Blockchain Opportunities Fund. And then we have the Spartan DeFi Venture Fund. So we just call it the Spartan VC Fund for now. Um, but yeah, so in terms of how we differentiate ourselves, like I said, I think we, we help founders primarily with three things. So number one is uh, for the go-to-market strategy in Asia. So we make strategic introductions to either investors in Asia, if they're kind of Western projects, or introductions to Western project, uh, Western investors, if they're Asian projects. Um, and also the number two is kind of integrations with other projects. So we, we help projects uh, find natural fits with different projects. So if you're a layer two project and you want other DeFi protocols to use your technology to increase their scalability, that's something that we can help you find uh, just based on our own kind of network and also our own portfolios of companies. And number three is we help with um, publicity for different projects as well. So um, we have multiple kind of media properties where I run a podcast called Block Crunch um, and one of our analysts runs a Telegram group as well. And we're relatively uh, active on Twitter as well. And even though it's it's somewhat unconventional, um, I think in traditional investing in crypto, we found that a lot of discovery for new projects really comes from social media because it's such a decentralized phenomenon. So we really try to evangelize the projects that we work with and really try to get them in the hands of uh, not just speculators, but more so kind of users who actually use these products. Uh, I mean, th that's the key if you're trying to build long term, I suppose, finding uh people that are actually going to use it and not just, you know, buy the token and try to sell at a higher price, which uh, happens a lot in this space. So uh, appreciate that there's competition for um, getting into the right projects, but uh, I'm sure you guys, given uh, you're one of the best at what you do, have a strict vetting process. So how do you select which projects you personally want to work with? Yeah, so I think one fallacy that a lot of investors tend to make in crypto is they focus a lot on the idea, right? They think about, okay, the idea of a lending marketplace or the idea of an AMM makes sense. That's why we're going to have some exposure there. So that's a very kind of traditional, I guess, equities portfolio mindset where you want some exposure in different verticals. But when it comes to venture, the final idea that really gets product market fit is seldom the first idea that the founder comes up with. So the most important thing we go after is really the founders. So we focus a lot of time trying to understand what's the motivation for the founder, right? Are they in this for the right reasons? Are they just opportunists who are here to kind of make a quick bug? Or do they really want to make something that is industry defining, right? We want to find people that have um, a very grand vision for how the protocols or how the products could impact the future of crypto. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two, you know, we do kind of basic background checks. We want to make sure, okay, these guys have the technical chops to pull off that vision if they do have a grand vision. And then finally, we, we actually focus on the product. So we prefer projects that already have some sort of a test net or some sort of product that we can actually play around with. So we can verify as a user whether it works or how we think about the product. Um, and as a final and fourth step, we usually do kind of... Um, reference checks with vendors or partners or projects that um, these protocols have integrated with just to figure out kind of how they work with other uh, players in the ecosystem. Um, so I'd say those are kind of four main steps, but each project is slightly different. Uh, that 
last point especially looking for references i've not had anyone mention that before so it's so simple but seems so uh, important and essential for like really uh, getting into the human side behind the founders by seeing what other people think of them it's, i mean it's the best way of finding out uh, as well as your own personal interaction but obviously that can uh, be a little misleading it's a small sample size to just have your own meetings with them uh, now all, all of this is very useful for a um for strategy as a fund now a lot of our listeners are retail uh, from what you've told us what can retail take from this what can they do to get involved in uh the DeFi space and start gaining exposure uh and upside exposure hopefully to these up and coming projects yeah that's an incredible question because i think a lot of people have this um false impression of VCs. They kind of see VCs as evil investors who try to get into heavily discounted early rounds and dump on retails. That's definitely true for bad investors. Um, but the reason that venture investors are able to get into cheaper early rounds for these tokens is because they usually take on the risk of a product not being launched yet, and they provide much more beyond just capital. So if VCs are doing their jobs well, they should be helping projects from with everything from you know token economics design to crisis management all these things that retail investors are not expected to do and that's kind of the and the payment for doing that is the discount they get in the early rounds now you're right in that most retail investors probably don't have access to that th those type of kind of discounted rounds those kind of private rounds but the beauty about crypto is there are so many projects that launch directly onto exchange that are fair launch onto uniswap or balancer that anyone can have immediate access to. So one of the largest, actually the largest yield aggregator project right now, Why Earn, was not launched with VC rounds at all. It was uh, fairly mined, fairly launched. So there are a lot of examples like that. Um, similarly for SushiSwap, uh, another huge AMM project that recently came up, uh, also no kind of VC rounds. And there are a lot of opportunities open to retail investors who really do their work and try to under understand the space. And it's really a level playing field, uh, much more so than traditional VC, I'd say. Uh, do you think those are the opportunities that um, typical retail should be focusing on? Uh, the quote unquote fairer launches, although um, fair is a subjective word, because obviously, if you do offer immense value and do um, help carry these projects and make them into working products, then it does seem just to get some sort of discount and early access to it. Yeah, so obviously this is not financial advice, but in terms of the opportunities that retails have, it really depends on your risk appetite, right? So most of the fair launch projects, they are by definition just being launched. So they're early on in their life cycle, there's probably more risk. You have to de-risk whether there is product market fit, you have to de-risk a lot of technical things that might not be figured out. You don't know if there's gonna be a bug, you know, three weeks into the contract launch. So those new launches are uh, typically a lot more riskier than projects that have more of a Lindy effect. So projects that have been around for maybe six months or 12 months or 24 months already. Um, so those tend to be valued at a bit of a premium. So things like Compound, Aave, products that have been around for a while, but they are relatively lower risk than a completely new lending protocol that comes out. So I think there's no kind of one thing that retail investors should look into, but if I were a retail investor looking at the space and I have you know, a relatively high risk tolerance, I would spend some time looking into the newer projects and not just kind of investing in them, but really jumping into the Discord and uh, giving suggestions, even early feedback on the products as users. Those things are incredibly helpful for founders. And I think a lot of folks that I know who, who did that early on managed to identify uh, huge projects very, very early on, just by being early uh, kind of community participants. So projects like Synthetics, uh, if you were kind of an early Discord participant, you're probably a really happy person today. Oh, we actually uh, did an article on a whole bunch of projects out right now that you can just go and try. And if history is to repeat, you could get rewarded for being one of the first people to try it. So I uh, really resonate and agree with you that uh, there is a huge amount of opportunity for everyone in the space, um, as well as uh, some uh, shadier dealings going on. But every industry has that and you just need to be able to separate uh, one from another. And it's far far better than the traditional system and we're just moving in a beautiful uh, direction right now. Uh, but as with all things, uh, uh, all cycles like this, it does at some point, uh, the tides turn, it does come to somewhat of a temporary end. And I'd love to know how a firm of your size is planning on handling the tide turning? What measures are in place to make sure that not only will you guys not get hurt by it, but thrive beyond it? 
Yeah, so I think that's part of the reason why we have two separate vehicles. So with the main kind of liquid hedge fund, um, it's structured as a long short fund with a heavy long bias. So we are positioned to be very bullish in the space, but in the short term, should there be kind of widespread market drawdowns, uh, especially given how cyclical the entire crypto market is, we have the opportunity to go short the market just to kind of protect our exposure. Now for the venture fund, we're a little less cycle agnostic given that we're, we don't have you know a six month, 12 month horizon where we're looking at five years in the future. And our entire thesis is that in five years, DeFi will be at a fundamentally different place compared to where it is today. So we care less about the um, kind of cycle fluctuations um, as we get there uh, in, in those five years. So for that fund, we basically just invest in the founders. We try to work with them until the thesis plays out. Um, whereas for the main fund, we do have the flexibility to trade around that. Um, and in terms of kind of what do we do to protect ourselves? Um, as I said, we could you know de-risk. We could take off some of our positions. Uh, we could go short on certain assets that we think are overheated as well. Um, but uh, I, I think in general, it's it's almost impossible to time a market top. So we are we just practice very good kind of risk management throughout the entire cycle to make sure that we don't ca get caught in, you know, black swan events and make sure we stay in the game. Uh, could, could you share some of these risk management practices that our listeners could perhaps start applying themselves? Obviously not as financial advice, just uh, what you would suggest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for so one thing that I learned when I first joined Spartan, one thing that I realized was that the the attention to risk is probably the biggest part of the job. Um, second only probably to finding good ideas to invest in. Um, so these are things such as monitoring your position sizes. Um, I think retail investors in this space tend to have this tendency to go all in into one project, uh, which is you know laudable in in in, in some. Um, perspectives, but it's definitely highly risky given that you know one drawdown and you basically wiped out. So watching a position size is a, a huge thing. And as you get to a certain size, liquidity is another huge risk as well. You don't want to uh, mark to market at a very high um, AUM. You don't want to you, you you don't want to feel like you're very paper rich only to be stuck in certain positions that you can't get out of. So liquidity is something that we monitor very closely as well. And there are all, also certain metrics that maybe pertain less to retail investors that we care about a lot. So things like benchmark risk, how far are we veering off from uh, the benchmarks that we want to compete with? So things like Bitcoin, maybe Bitwise 10 or CCI 30, which is an uh, index of 30 crypto uh, cryptocurrencies. And we also th look at things like value at risk. So we look at historical analysis about the worst drawdowns in crypto history and look at our current exposure and imply, should those events play out similarly what does that imply about a portfolio drawdown that day? So no matter what happens, we won't be very surprised about, we will be kind of prepared for any scenario that happens. Now, obviously, um, historical analysis, you can't use that to apply to future, you know, performance of a portfolio, but that at least gives it an idea of, you know, how bad could things get and should we be taking risk off where we think the probability for things going bad is getting higher. Uh, it sounds so structured and um, so rigid in process and uh, this just came up as a curiosity here um on a personal human level uh, you you guys are a huge fund now operating like a machine managing um nine figures of um wealth out of assets D does the emotional side still play up as a problem ever like it, it, are there sometimes emotionally really hard decisions that have to be made even though you're this huge like large organization now yeah absolutely and I think that that is a huge part of the uh, of the game as well. Um, you know, for for myself, I'm not a trader, so I'm not kind of day trading um, assets every day. We're mostly kind of just focusing um, on investments that we think have a long term potential. Now, that being said, in our main fund, we do have the capability to take on opportunistic trades. So if we think there's a certain catalyst that could re-rate an asset, then we might put on a trade. Um, so there is some short-term trading. And in those scenarios, when things go against you, there's definitely that emotional element. Um, so we try to be very methodical about it. We try to determine the range in which we, we have to re revisit our thesis. So if, if our acceptable drawdown for this one trade or this one investment is say 30, 40%, if it almost reaches that level, say the asset's coming down 30, 40% against um, our entry, we start to kind of reevaluate. Should we be doubling down here? Has, have our, has our thesis changed or should we be cutting the position? So I think having methodologies like that in place uh, make sure that you don't freak out when something's down 10, 20 percent. Uh, you know exactly when you have to do what uh, at kind of each kind of price tier. 
Uh, I think that's a really actionable piece of advice that anyone at any level can definitely apply to um, not just trading, but anything in, right, in life, really having a plan in advance for when things go against you. So when you're in those more emotional moments, you don't make stupid mistakes. Let's take a small break to talk about you trust. A lot of you know that one of my main reasons for being in the cryptocurrency space is because I think it can change the world. And for it to do so, adoption is one of the most important things to happen. That's why I could not be more excited to have partnered with Utrust. Now, Utrust are a payment gateway provider. What this means is that just like you use MasterCard, Stripe, or PayPal, you can now accept cryptocurrency payments with the same ease. Not only that, but they allow you to get paid out in your preferred currency of choice. So you don't even take on the volatility risk of crypto while allowing all of your customers to pay in any of the supported cryptocurrencies they'd want to. And they charge less than Stripe, PayPal, or most of the other traditional competitors out there as well. Coupled with a seamless user interface, you'd be doing your business a disservice by at least not trying you trust out. Make sure to visit utrust.com. That's U-T-R-U-S-T dot com. Following on from that, like you've, you've mentioned the five year time frame a few times now. Uh, is that an indication that you guys think DeFi has about five years to go before it really has solid infrastructure and uh, use case globally? Um, not at all. So uh, I think that's more of a product of the typical venture um, life cycle. So typical VC funds are structured usually with a five to 10 year kind of life. Um, and if you look at even large funds like A16Z, um, they might have, I think, like five to 10 year fund lives, but that doesn't mean they think crypto is you know, done in 10 years. They actually, uh, halfway through deployment or after they deployed through the first fund, they actually raised a second fund that also has maybe a five, 10 year lifetime. So it kind of just rolls over like that. So the, the duration of the fund is not as much an expression of our thesis on the space, more just, um, I guess, relatively arbitrary for us to maintain a decently long um, kind of long-term oriented enough, but also have enough flexibility to to revise our thesis. Mm, I, I love how open you are to revising that thesis with, again, just more actionable advice that uh, you have no attachment to being right, <laughs> probably attachment to um, running a profitable fund, which are very different things. Uh, and I, I follow on from that then. Um, right now, what would determine success for you guys have you i'm sure you have a plan a range target that you want to be at in five years time what would be a cause for celebration that you've set out and accomplished what well, you've accomplished the goals that you've set out yeah i think if the um so the, there are a few metrics that we're, we we have in mind so given that we're uh, kind of DeFi specific one i think things like if lending volume on these decentralized protocols overtakes uh, certain kind of centralized institutions, that would be a great metric. If trading volumes on DEXs overtake all of the centralized exchanges in, in, in crypto, that would be a great metric as well. Um, on a fund perspective, on an investment perspective, um, since we're a venture fund, we're not looking for 20, 30, 100% returns. We're looking for you know venture scale returns. So anywhere from 20x plus. So uh, we determine an investment in a success if it achieves the thesis that we set it out for. Um, so if we achieve a certain level of adoption and if the kind of returns for it is on the venture scale, so if it's 20x plus, I think that would be a pretty good heuristic for success. Uh, I mean, that sounds like very sensible targets. I love how you um, separate it into each individual venture because they're all going to be different, of course, and you don't know in advance what's going to come your way. So there's definitely going to be an element of flexibility and um, just looking for opportunities. Uh, speaking of opportunities, which I think uh, a lot of listeners will find quite amazing, is that you guys are hiring for new analysts or a new analyst. Um, what do you guys look for? in someone you hire and bring onto the team. I'm sure that's a very important part of the future success who comes on. Yeah, so we pay a lot of attention to to hiring um, and we basically filter, first of all, for uh, basic interest in DeFi, right? Do you have an awareness of DeFi? It, uh, do you follow the news closely enough? Do you uh, have maybe a network in DeFi? So we kind of filter through that with our own uh, kind of analyst quiz and we ask our uh, analysts to submit a investment pitch 
And we're not really looking for someone to give us a profitable trade idea or an investment idea. We're more interested in how that person thinks. So uh, in terms of the number one thing that we're looking for is someone who's incredibly curious, um, who is willing to drill down to the rabbit hole in terms of uh, figuring out how protocols work, how did it accrue value, um, and really think critically about the risks of each investment. Um, I think a lot of things, um, especially kind of traditional valuation methodologies, how to build DCFs, those things are not as important because those things can be trained. But one thing that really can't be trained is your curiosity and your determination. So those are kind of behavioral things that we also try to test for in our interviews and in our multiple conversations with the candidates. Uh, curiosity sounds like such a difficult thing to test for, especially in a 30 to one hour meeting. Uh, uh, if you're comfortable, could you share an example of not one you use or maybe a similar one or a any test that would spot curiosity in a candidate? Yeah, I think it's actually relatively easy in crypto just because it's so such an esoteric topic. So if someone is spending a lot of time talking about you know how much money I made in this trade or that trade, and but you've drilled into the project, drilled into the specific investments, and they're not able to explain how that project works, even though they were profitable in that investment. It likely means that they have more of a mercenary mindset, which is totally fine, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. Um, so we try to dive really deep into the projects and try to kind of challenge your thinking on how specific projects work. Uh, what are some trade-offs of the design of this protocol? Um, and typically you'll find the most curious um, candidates really understanding um, the risks that they took on in their investments and in the projects that they care about. And you're able to kind of go off on this entire tangent. And typically, I think in, in great interviews is when I realized that, okay, we're kind of out of time, but I re really want to keep listening to you talk about this product. That's when you when I get a great sign that, okay, this is a really curious person that I really would love to work with. Yeah, I mean, if you can't get enough of talking to them, obviously you want to, uh, it'll be great to work with them and you have similar interests and goals aligned. I'm pretty sure you can't get to the level you're at now without a certain level of obsession. And it even comes across in your answers. Everything I ask you has, it's like you fought it through a million times already and it's just <laughs> a prepared, not pre-prepared, but you know, a prepared answer that it's part of your thesis. You know what your opinion is on this. And how strongly do you hold on to those opinions? What are your thoughts of uh, sticking to your convictions in the market versus having a very flexible opinion? Yeah, I think that's one of the more fascinating parts about being part of a fund that has a hedge fund and also a VC fund. So for a hedge fund, you're rewarded with being able to align your view with the market as quickly as possible. So if we're wrong about a project, if our thesis is fundamentally wrong, we will be punished if we don't change that thesis as quickly as possible because the value accrual will go to other protocols where the thesis is actually favoring. So for that fund, uh, I was really trained to kind of change my bias very quickly and really try to challenge my own thinking. Um, whereas for a VC fund, uh, you really have to have a certain degree of understanding and conviction about where the space is heading. Because once you commit to a founder, it's not a trade, right? You can't just dump the tokens, even though some VCs may do that. Um, you have to really commit to the founder and commit to working with them and develop this multi-year relationship. So that fund, I think investing out of a VC fund is actually a bit harder than a hedge fund, given that you need to have that conviction and stick to your opinions. Now, obviously, if we're wrong on in an investment, um, we will have to find some ways to either maybe work with the founder to revise the product to fit it fit in with um, kind of what the what the right direction should be. But at the time, but but at many times, I think for the VC fund, uh, the feedback loop is so long that you don't realize you're wrong until after the fund is over. Until five years later, you realize, wow, the thesis really hasn't played out. Whereas for the hedge fund side, for a trade, you can find out maybe within a day or a week or a month that your trade didn't work out. So it's very, two very different games. Um, but I think going back to your original question, um, I think for, for liquid investing, the, the goal really is to be able to kind of change your bias as quickly as possible. Whereas for venture fund is about doing enough work beforehand to have the conviction so that you don't have to change your bias that much. No, which makes sense why you guys have such uh, strict and thought out things that you look for beforehand. It's like, that's the hardest, most important bit. And then <laughs> whatever you do, it's like a five year commitment. You're really marrying to these projects. Uh, whereas with liquid ex investing, you, you, you can go in and out of positions as you please. Um, but luckily there is that five year to five to 10 year mark where the thesis can start to change. Uh, it's a much longer term play and I'm sure there are um, larger rewards attached to it because of that long term element to it. Um, 
Now, a specific part separate to the DeFi space that I've seen you talk about um, rather cautiously is the NFT space. Uh, is there a reason? Um, because uh, is there a reason you're not quite as uh, bullish on NFTs? Yeah, so I actually had a great discussion with uh, a fellow investor who uh, is an OG in the space. So his name is Nick Tomeno. He's a, a founder of One Confirmation, and he was. Um, I invited him onto my podcast to convince me uh, to educate me on why um, why NFTs is a huge opportunity. So. For me, my skepticism comes from a few things. So looking at things like CryptoKitties back in 2017, we saw a massive surge in speculative demand and prices of CryptoKitties going to you know, $10,000, $2,000, uh, $20,000 for, uh, for a digital kitty. And then the eventual collapse, the implosion of the entire thing. And to me, it seems like such a speculative thing. Whereas for DeFi, I'm able to model out the cash flows. I know exactly how to value these assets, even though the market may not be valuing these assets based on those cash flows and dividends today, there is at least some fundamental value that I can ascribe it to. And even for Bitcoin, there is a narrative around the digital gold uh, meme that I can at least understand and put a number to. Now, if you give me a digital cat, I don't necessarily know how much that is worth. Um, so I think that the counterpoint to that is usually that, well, everything is valid based on a meme, based on a narrative. So that part I can understand. But what I'm starting to come to terms with is that investing in specific NFTs, not talking about the marketplaces or anything that supports the NFT industry, but specific pieces of digital collectibles, it has more in similarity with kind of investing in art, uh, maybe investing in films, specific games, than investing in equities. So for DeFi, um, you can hire an equity analyst, maybe within a month or two, they can learn how to value most of these tokens. If you start an NFT digital collectible fund, I think the equity analyst is probably going to be useless in that fund. You probably want to find an art kind of investor who knows how to pick what art people will value in the long term. So maybe it's that defined in skill sets, maybe because I don't have that DNA in me that I don't fully um, comprehend the, um, the kind of potential for NFTs, but I'm really open to having my mind changed on that. Uh, th that makes a lot of sense. It's, um, I mean, it's very much you sticking to your circle of competence. And beyond that, you're uh, actively bringing guests onto Block Crunch, your podcast, which everyone listening to this, to this should definitely go check out um, to find out more about it. But no, that's what makes the best podcast episodes. I um, had asked you on and you were kind enough to come uh, teach us all a little bit more about early stage investing in DeFi projects, the future of the space, how to run a VC fund, diving into detail on um, the investment thesis, the risks involved, changing that into tangible and information for the audiences. Um, and I'm rambling here, but to um, continue on the NFT point, uh, have you considered, and uh, this is just me speculating here, uh, comparing it to existing physical markets, uh, for example, an idea a friend uh, and I were discussing, which if anyone interested wants to pursue, go ahead, it'd be amazing to build, is uh, take comics, for example. If you look at the physical comic market and imagine if every artist could just sell NFT copies of their comics online. The e-comic space is blowing up and you can make that sort of comparison where it's not a crypto kitty, it's actually a tangible in existing business being translated into an NFT model. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I think there's actual you know revenues generated by some of these marketplaces like Super Rare, Rarible, um, these marketplaces that are allowing people to trade different types of digital collectibles. My kind of um, contention there is that for most of the non-fungible tokens, because they're by definition non-fungible, the, the volume, the velocity that they're traded is often a tiny fraction of fungible tokens. So whereas, you know, an Aave token on Uniswap can swap hands maybe like 10,000 times a day, a piece of art on a marketplace may swap hands like three or four times a month. So the fee that is extracted from each trade is probably a fraction that of um, kind of fungible token exchanges. So there is a limit to how much of an analogy we can draw between the two. Um, but I do think that the key to success for maybe an NFT marketplace is if you're able to lock in a long tail of many, many, many NFTs, then even if each of them just swaps hand once a day, you're still able to generate massive uh, revenue. So there are parallels with this uh, in the traditional world. Um, so I, I do think it's a viable business, um, but I just haven't had, I haven't seen one that I am uh, you know, excited about enough to invest yet. 
Um, well, that's a fantastic answer again. Uh, definitely seeing a recurring theme there. Uh, well, Jason, that covers the entire section of BC, everything I wanted to ask about and more which you've shared with us. Uh, as we come to the end of this podcast, I'd love to discuss Block Crunch a little bit um, because I think anyone listening to our podcast would benefit from listening to yours. Uh, how did you start Block Crunch and um, what is it all about? Yeah, so Block Crunch really is an excuse for me to get people to come on the show and talk to me and teach me things because uh, this was back in 2018 uh, when I graduated from college. I graduated in 2017. Um, and I really wanted to learn about crypto. So I read uh, Chris Berniski's Crypto Assets book. I, I tried to read every book and every article that I could find. And I realized that um, there's still so much that I got to learn. And why don't I just go directly to the guys who wrote this, these books or to the guys who wrote these articles? But then I realized that these guys are incredibly busy people. They really don't have a reason to talk to a random kind of college graduate. So I decided, okay, I probably have to give them something first before they will kind of teach me things. So I decided to start my own podcast to give them a platform and a few folks were incredibly generous in the beginning to come onto the show. So folks like Adam Draper was the very first guest. Chris Berniski is one of the first guests I had as well. Nick, who I just mentioned, was also one of the first guests and really got the snowball kind of rolling there. Um, initially, the show didn't really have a thesis. It was just kind of anything in crypto. So we talked about trading. We talked about DeFi before DeFi was a thing. We talked about Web3. And really, in the past year, we've kind of narrowed it down to more talking about um, kind of long-term thesis, specific projects, uh, trend breakdowns, and speaking mostly to kind of founders and maybe other fund managers in the space. Um, but to date, it's really just a reflection of what I'm trying to learn about and what I'm looking into. And uh, is there a reason you still um, continue it despite probably having much higher ROI in your time? But correct me if I'm wrong, just 100% focusing on the fund? Yeah, yeah. I, I ask myself that question all the time as well when I'm up at 3 a.m. trying to edit episodes. Um, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you get the uh, the same impression from, from running your own podcast as well. But to me, it's it, it really doesn't make sense unless it's a core part of your strategy, right? So for Block Crunch, it allows me to build a network of amazing people, of founders, of investors. It also has grown to a point where it's already a, it, it's a platform for me to evangelize certain projects or founders that I'm very excited about. Um, so to that extent, it actually feeds into that investment strategy. Now, if I wasn't able to grow it to where it is today and it's completely kind of separate from the investing part of the job, I might have given up maybe a year ago, but um, I really looked to this guy called Harry Stebbings who hosts a podcast called 20 Minute VC. He's one of the largest venture uh, capital general kind of VC podcast. And really from that podcast, he was able to spin out his own fund and his own um, his, his own venture fund and his own kind of angel fund as well. Um, so I kind of looked to that model and thought, hey, someone should do this in crypto. And um, why, why not me? So uh, that, that's kind of the rationale for why I keep doing it. I mean, that's such a good thesis. And I think it sends a really good message as well. Just see someone do something. Most people are like, I could never do that. Um, the the fact that you have the confidence to say, why not me, is an incredible thing, which I try to push all the time with people trying to get involved in the crypto space. If you see anyone doing anything cool, you can probably do it too. I mean, we live in a day and age where um, as long as you can be patient, work hard and work smart, you can do anything you want and just do it consistently and you'll outperform most people. Uh, so really fantastic to see that. And uh, I guess my last question to do with the podcasting would be, um, once you get this network, how do you maintain it? So what do you, do you take steps to make sure you maintain it and stay in contact with the people that come onto your show? Yeah, so I, I definitely need to do a better job at this. But then, um, you know, crypto is such a small space that a lot of people that I bring on the show happen to be in the same Telegram groups and the same Slack groups. And we end up kind of swapping ideas every now and then. And a lot of these relationships kind of um, evolve into professional relationships as well, where, you know, we share deal flow, we invest uh, in some of the projects and we invest in each other. Um, so I think crypto is a, a space that's small enough for relationships to still be very intimate and non-transactional, which is something I really love. Um, but in terms of kind of operationally scaling that, um, I haven't done anything in that in that regard, but I'm open to uh, any feedback there, definitely. <laughs> um, I mean, I was hoping to get some advice as well, because same as uh, the more people you get on, the more people that is to stay in contact with. And um, it's one of the best things about the podcast. You meet awesome people, you get along with them, but sometimes uh, you just don't manage to keep that relationship uh, going, at least on the same level as a conversation like this. 
Uh, but guys, that was a whole host of knowledge for you, a plethora of things to write down, think upon, and potentially implement to improve your own lives. Uh, as we come to the actual end of the podcast, Jason, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with, be that a goodbye, I had some fun, words of advice, or uh, a plug for any of the awesome projects you're working on? Yeah, most definitely. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. And I think for people who want to dive deeper into what's happening late, uh, lately with the newest projects in DeFi, I uh, definitely recommend you to check out the podcast, uh, The Block Crunch. And uh, you can find it on Twitter under at The Block Crunch, where we have kind of weekly episodes with DeFi founders, with fund managers to talk about the long-term trends in this space. Um, and I've been lucky enough to have a lot of really talented people come on the show. So um, I'm I hope that you enjoy some of the insight that uh, I've enjoyed hearing from these folks. Oh, well, I'm sure you all will. So make sure to check that out. There'll be a link in the description below. Meditators, that is it from us for another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. Until next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like us to continue bringing you fascinating people from across the world, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen to these podcasts and share the episode with a friend. If you have feedback or an idea for a potential guest, reach out to me on Twitter at Karush AK. And do not forget, we write a newsletter covering all important topics in crypto and traditional markets. We send it out three times a week, the Market Meditations newsletter. You also get early access to these episodes and you get transcripts and extra notes as well. So make sure to subscribe there as well.